cytology, the field of study of cells is called cytology. Remember cytology, histology, anatomy, physiology, and all of that, what do they mean? Don't forget, okay? It's few weeks, so it's all down the drain now. Retain all that information we did earlier. Okay, so cytology is the study of cells, okay? And um, you have in the cell what we call a fluid, which is the cytosol, and then the organelles, the various membrane-bound compartments, and the cell cytosol plus the organelles they consider as cytoplasm. Okay, and the whole thing is the cell. Everybody clear on that? And then you have, uh, there are like five uh, basic uh, like statements regarding cells. What, what are cells? Where do they come from? It's good to quickly read through that. All organisms, obviously living organisms, are made up of cells. Okay? And the cell is what? By definition is the simplest or the smallest structural and functional unit for a cell. Right. And uh, not for a cell for life or living organism. When you take the cell, it will be the organelles because they also do some things. Okay, so the structural and functional unit for life or living organisms is cell. And then cells come from pre-existing cells. Some cell divides and makes more cells. But in the beginning, it came from those organelles. They assembled each organel, like mitochondria and all, even it's uh, uh, proposed to be like some primitive form of life in those millions of years before the cells formed. Okay. Uh, and cell drives most of the activities. Uh, and then you have the cells of all organisms have some similarities okay, in the way they function, the way they are structured with some variations in shape and size. So that leads us to cell shape and sizes. So you can see a bunch of different types of cells if you turn over to the figure 3 1. Squamous, if you took the lab, you may have already talked about or seen the squamous cells, right? Cuboidal, columnar. The, when you discuss the tissue introduction to the, the squamous cells are flat, cuboidal or cube-like, columnar, those cells are tall, and look at the shape, some are polygonal, multiple-sided, some look like star, stellate, uh, round, spheroid, uh, discoid, or red blood cells like a disc, a fusiform, they look like cano or uh, like a boat, fibrous, they look like fibers, long cylindrical, right? So these are all some of the various shapes of the cells, but you will find them <coughs> different tissues. So as you go along, you will know which tissues have these cells. Okay. So right now they have discussed only the shapes. But some of you who know about the neurons, or if you have looked at the neurons, muscle cell, you, you can see them right here in the pictures. Some of them are in the muscles, some are in the skin, some are in the nervous tissue. Size of the cells vary from very few microns to higher values. So if you see figure 3, 2, you have two cells, right? One small, one like a cheese cube, right? So when you change the dimensions, what is happening to the area and volume? They have one, it says large cell, one it says small cell, and then uh, the next one it says the effect. So compare the diameter of one versus the other, how many times it has increased? Only two times, 10 to 20 micron. But what about the surface area and volume? Fourfold or eightfold, <coughs> see? So once you increase a little bit of the area, you have more surface area based on the simple math or more volume. So the cell size matters, okay? So wherever you need more surface area to absorb something or uh, take in or send out something across the membrane, you'll find more surface area or more volume, depending on the needs. So the point is the cell size varies and there is a reason for that and how uh, it uh, impacts the surface area and the volume. Then to look at all these components of the cell, somebody did not go and sketch out from their imagination. Maybe they did before it was scientifically proven. So people 
this got the microscope, different kinds of microscope, your simple microscope with one lens, or you have the double lens in the compound microscope that you have in the lab, or you have what they call electron microscope that can even see beyond, okay? Some of them are scanning electron microscope, some are called transmission electron microscope. Scanning electron microscope scans the surface of the cell and shows you the three rather two-dimensional image of the, of the surface features, whereas the transmission electron microscope looks through the thin <coughs> slice of the cell or the tissue and shows the internal details. So you can see that in figure 3.3. Three. So 3.3 three shows all the structures you may have uh, already looked up. If you looked up this chapter or if you are in the lab, you may have do you guys, uh, my students already did the cell. Is there anybody who has not done the cell in the lab so far? You should have, right? Unless you had extra holidays, okay? So what you see here in the transmission electron micrograph in this page, this is what you see on that model. Maybe not exactly, not here in the lab, okay? Uh, so you can see the nucleus, you can see the, uh, the the chromosome in the middle, you see the mitochondria, the Golgi, okay? So they did not design those model from nothing. So they saw these shapes and the models and drawings are to represent what they have seen in real self, okay? Then you can turn over the page, you see the difference between a light microscope image and a TEM image, transmission electron microscope image. Which one has more details? The resolution, the TEM, okay? Okay, moving on, you'll find at the bottom of the page, ICF, ECF, cytosol. So the cytosol is inside or outside the cell? Inside, right? That's also called intracellular fluid within the cell. What is external to the cell, whatever fluid that you find between cells or in the spaces between cells outside is considered extracellular fluid. Extra external, intra internal. Okay. Now we will look at the cell structure and the compartments. So we'll get started today and we will finish it up and start on chapter four in the following classes. I want you to take uh, two, three minutes and look at the details of the cell, the structure they have given, figure three, five, and you have one more nice picture. Uh, I will give you the page, there's another page, the whole page has the cell long. Uh, 103, figure 325, it's more like a two-dimensional image. So you can compare both, okay, one on page 83 and 103. Yes, I wanted to take a look at all the names and where <coughs> they are. You have done the lab, it's more like a review for you. First and foremost thing for a cell, before we can dive into the cell, what is that you encounter? <coughs> Plasma, membrane. Plasma membrane. What is the other name for that? Cell membrane. Plasma membrane. 
what is it made of? Mainly <coughs> phospholipids. You have those phospholipids. Remember, we saw under lipids the three categories: phospholipids, eicosanoids, and steroids. The phospholipids are the bilayers or the two layers of the cell membrane. It has a hydrophilic side and hydrophobic side, which means they are amphiphilic. They have both uh, properties. So the hydrophobic side is towards the inside or outside of the membrane. Inside, inside of the membrane, facing each other. The hydrophilic side is towards the watery medium, either inside or outside the cell. Okay. So first of all, you have the cell membrane. Right? This one. And besides the phospholipids, you may find some proteins and also some glycoproteins and so on. We will see that in a little bit, okay? So first of all, you need to understand <coughs> what this membrane is made of. If you turn over the page, uh, you can see a microscopic image that shows the plasma membrane of the neighboring cells. And there is a little space which they call the intracellular space between the two membranes. And within one cell, you see the little bit of the nucleus with the nuclear envelope. And then at the bottom of the page, what do we see? You see a clear illustration of the phospholipids arranged in two layers. And you see the purple structures, which are your proteins, which act as gated channels to facilitate water-based hydrophilic molecules to go in and out. Some, they do it just based on the concentration gradient from where it's more to where it's less. But in some cases, you need uh, ATP, energy. So whenever you use energy, it's going to be called active transport. Otherwise, it's passive transport. But we will discuss that later. So just look at the figure, what are the things you can find in a cell membrane. Okay, you can find proteins, phospholipids, then you can find some glycoproteins and glycolipids. So the green uh, structures, each tiny unit represents your glucose. Remember we earlier saw the carbohydrates, those uh, six-sided structure, the hexagonal structures, those are the six carbon sugars. Uh, so they are linked to one another. So it looks like a branching tree or something or a twig. So that's basically your sugar. When it's attached to the lipid, they call it glycolipid. It's attached to the protein, it's a glycoprotein. They have certain role in helping two cells to attach or to give ID to the cell for some functions that will be discussed later on. So you have all these components present in the cell. And if you see some of the proteins, they are on the edges. Some are located within the membrane and some extend across the membrane. Can you see that? So they call them peripheral protein if they are on the periphery. If it's extending all the way across, they call them transmembrane proteins. You see the labeling? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. And the channel is a gap within the protein through which things pass. So under membrane proteins, they have discussed integral proteins, transmembrane proteins, peripheral proteins. And what these are, how they are different structurally, should be obvious from the picture. That's why I'm using the picture. You can always read this, and the words are highlighted. You can do that. Let's please do that. Okay. And the. Uh, proteins have other functions, okay, all these different kind of proteins. Some, as you can see, they are channels for movement. Uh, some, uh, see all the highlighted words from now on, they're all some of the functions of proteins. We discussed general functions earlier when we did the uh, proteins separately, you know, carbs, proteins, lipids. Here it's more specific, but it relates to what they have said earlier also. They, they function as receptors for some signals from outside. They trigger some actions inside the cell. That's the first one. Then the second one, so in order to trigger some action inside the cell, you need to activate something else, okay? So there can be a second protein inside the cell. That's what they call second messenger system. And enzymes. Enzymes, as we said earlier, they're all proteins. And then channel proteins. We already see the channel, right? And 
and then moving on carriers carriers means some of them they are specific for certain substances like they may have glucose transporters or sodium transporters so some of the proteins can only transport certain compound that's when you call them carrier and then cell identity markers. So some of the body cells have certain proteins that give them unique identity to tell the immune cells that these cells belong to our body and they are not foreign. Then cell adhesion mo molecules, some uh, glycoproteins are involved in attaching cells to one another. Uh, so figure 3 8 shows you all the uh, possible examples, okay, from left to right. You may want to take a look at that. These all are not arranged exactly like what you see in the picture. This is just an example. You may have 10 of one, millions of other, or they may be randomly arranged depending on the needs, depending on the cell. Here they have put everything in one picture so you know what is what. First is a receptor, what is happening. Second is an enzyme, it's converting something, it's breaking down, right? Third is a channel, ion channel, some ions are moving in. Then the, you have the gated ion channel. Then you have the cell identity marker, and then the cell addition molecule. So whatever they have discussed, you can relate these images to understand what they have described. And coming to the second messenger, you have the next figure, 3 9, that shows you what is a second messenger or third messenger and so on. Somebody is at the door, you are cooking and somebody else goes and opens the door for that guy. Something like that. So who is uh, knocking your door? The first messenger. Think of the cell as your house. The receptor is your door. Or the doorbell. Okay. And so what's happening? The guy who is going and answering, that's your G protein. Okay. You see the pink the letter G. So this G protein activates something else. It's another enzyme, adenylate cyclase. So adenylate cyclase uh, breaks down the ATP to AMP and releases energy. Okay. And this AMP, whenever it's not ATP or ADP, whenever it's an AMP, this enzyme, as the name tells, what is the name of the enzyme in uh, that light green or bluish green? Adenylate cyclase. So it makes the AMP cyclic, meaning instead of the structure being like this, it, it makes it like attached to both ends. So that, that's why they call it CAMP, cyclic AMP. It's done by that enzyme. So it, it is called cyclase. Okay. So basically, uh, the cyclic AMP is very important in many cell reactions inside of the cell. That's your second messenger, okay? So somebody went and opened the door and then the responsible person comes in and talks to you. Okay, something like that. You have a receptor coming. Uh, I mean, the, there is some molecule coming from outside binding to the receptor. And then that, that triggers a set of reactions that triggers another enzyme. Then you make the cyclic AMP and the cyclic AMP is involved in triggering further reaction. Okay. Down downstream, going down. Okay. So when those other reactions are happening, you may be turning on something, turning off something within the cell. Okay. This is uh, just to illustrate how uh, various steps are involved for a cell to work or function. Then some of the cell membranes have some structures they call, uh, if you see the <coughs> glycocalyx, glycocalyx is a fuzzy coat that helps cells to attach to one another or to other surfaces. And then if you turn on the page, you see some modified structures like microvilli, cilia, flagella. You can take a look at the images. The microvilli you'll find in your intestines, they help <coughs> to increase 
instead of a structure being like this, if it's like this, you'll have more surface area, so you can absorb more nutrients, for example, in the small intestine. So you'll find them in the intestine. The cilia, you'll find in your, uh, inside your nose, the tissue lining the inside of your nose uh, produces mucus and cilia. Uh, they have the columnar type cells, the tall cells, and those cilia help to move the dirt, whatever goes into your nose. So it's trapped by the mucus and the cilia pushes it back and it eliminates through the digestive system. Flagella, flagella are modified structures that resemble the tail. Some, uh, like sperms, they have a tail, okay? So flagellum is an example uh, for a tail. Like bacteria, they swim with their tail, so you can think of the sperm, they have a flagellum with, with which it can swim. So they have uh, described this in detail. Uh, if you want to understand more, uh, you have the example uh, on figure 312, how the cilia function. They have given you the cells that produce mucus and that they have cilia. I'll give you a few minutes to look that up if you want to. Then we will start with the membrane transport. Okay, uh, membrane transport is transport across the membrane. Which membrane are we talking about? The cell membrane or? Plasma, plasma membrane. Okay, and what did we say it's made of? Phospholipids. So they are hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophobic. hydrophobic. Okay, so hydrophilic molecules can pass through uh, only select structures that are formed by proteins. Okay, <coughs> so Selectively <coughs> permeable, what does it mean? It means that the plasma mem membrane only selectively allows things to pass through, okay? Uh, one selectivity comes from the hydrophobic, hydrophilic nature. The other selectivity is even the uh, gated channels, the ion channels, which are the proteins, they can allow only certain size molecules, okay? So if somebody is too heavy, they have to go through some other door, meaning the vesicles, okay? You need the vesicles to transport other substances. So some of the transport processes, if you see, uh, they, they discuss the passive and active transport. I don't know where they have talked about that, but let me just to be consistent <coughs> and to be on the same page. Whenever you say some transport occurs without any help, just where you have more of one item, one substance, to the other side where there is nothing or less. So that kind of movement is passive. You don't need any help. You have more here, it goes to where it's less. Like if you spray here, you'll smell in no time there. And if you put a dye in a glass of water, you'll see it diffuses over time, right? The whole thing is the same color. Initially, you see it's very dark where you drop the dye, okay? So when you have active transport, that means here you don't need no energy or help. Active transport needs energy in the form of what? ATP. Okay, or vesicles. 
okay sometimes uh, <clears throat> they, they call this kind of passive process by two names one is diffusion diffusion is a passive process of substances moving from higher to lower concentration along a concentration gradient okay high to low sometimes you need help from proteins not ATP or vesicles the gated channels when they help <coughs> they call this facilitated diffusion because okay you have the lipid bilayer right water cannot pass through water dissolved water soluble molecules cannot pass through gases can pass or hydrophobic substances can pass based on the simple diffusion but water based molecules can pass through only the gated channels so if it is happening with the help of these proteins without energy without anything else that's just facilitated diffusion so it's still diffusion based on concentration gradient if it's more here it goes here if it's more here it goes here right so there's no energy involved nothing else is involved so it's just supported or facilitated diffusion by the carrier proteins we saw the carrier proteins a little earlier but if you have to use ATP right then it becomes active energy and when do you think we will need that if it has to move from high to low concentration we don't need a whole lot of help okay but if you have to move something from low to high concentration okay, even though you have proteins you are going uphill instead of downhill right you need extra help that's when you need ATP okay so that's very important when you move uphill that's when you need energy so you can just think of some day day to day life okay so when you walk downhill you don't need a whole lot of energy when you go uphill you need more energy right and some substances that cannot pass through these channels they need vesicles so the vesicles are made up of the same kind of membranes like the bilayered membrane so these can carry something and whichever organelle we are talking about or even the cell membrane itself because it's made up of the same kind of phospholipids they can go and merge and they can release it outside <coughs> or bring it inside so large molecules that cannot pass through the channels they use vesicles so think of vesicles and vehicles okay so if you need to transport large molecules you will need vesicles okay so uh, all of this is discussed and how the solutions or uh, concentrations affect inside and outside the shape and behavior of cells and how the vesicles mediate the transport so if you will read through that I cannot spend too much time on that that's why I gave you an introduction and assuming and hoping and wishing that you are reading uh, we will cover that in the first 10 minutes and then we will discuss about the cell organelles and then we will move on to chapter 4 when we are done with chapter 3. Okay. If anybody walked in late, please stop by to see.